did go to the show last night. Okay, so those of you who went to the show are aware of the fact that I told a lot of half-truths. Um, because that's what you have to do uh, when you're doing a public lecture. Um, so some of those half-truths may have bothered you, and I'll be perfectly happy to answer questions about those half-truths, but I'll actually tell the truth in some of the, uh, the things that I'll, uh, I'll discuss this morning. So maybe we'll wait a little bit, uh, and, uh, and I'll take questions about the uh, uh, last night's lecture as well as, uh, as today's lecture. Uh, now I'm supposed to stop around 10, is that the idea? Yeah, so you have an hour and a half, but you can... No, I don't. To... Not if I'm supposed to stop at 10, because you took five minutes. So. <laughs> no, but what I wanted to do, if you want to take a break halfway through, you, mm. it's up to you, or you want to organize yourself. I don't need a break, maybe they do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's, let's, let's get to it. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be around until Wednesday morning, which means that if you want to talk to me, then you have to find me before Wednesday morning. Uh, and I'm going to make myself available as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, you, if you want to eat lunch with me or breakfast or whatever, just find me and we'll, we'll do that. We can talk physics. Uh, uh, if you want to talk physics in the evening, I'm in uh, Casita 2400, which has no number on it. Uh, but it's uh, adjacent to 2404 and it's um, across from where the lookout point is. So. Uh, if that's not enough, um, ask me more and I'll show you where it is. Uh, if you want to talk to me, just come up and we'll talk, uh, or uh, we'll decide a time when we can talk. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be telling you about uh, uh, laser cooling and trapping and Bose-Einstein compensation, which is actually quite a tall order in two lectures, although you've already had uh, a lot of this stuff from Han Pu, right? Uh, I will cover some of the same material but in a much less formal way, uh, being experimentalists. Okay, so um, why, why do we want to cool and trap atoms? Well, the original motivation, and still uh, the most important practical application, uh, is atomic clocks, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. But today, I would say that the current scientific focus is really uh, a whole new field of cold atom physics that has to do with uh, uh, making new kinds of physical systems, often that have connections to condensed matter physics, but in some cases that represent entirely new kinds of quantum systems that, uh, uh, that have been realized in the fact that we, have, uh, that we have cold atoms. And I think that Wendell Hill just walked in. Uh, uh, Pierre was uh, telling people about you. Uh, the reason I'm interested in Wendell is because he's my scientific collaborator at uh, at the Joint Quantum Institute, but uh, you're probably interested in it because of his uh, role with the, uh, the National Science Foundation. Uh, okay, so before, uh, before laser cooling, this is what an atomic clock looked like. Um, so the electronic ground state of cesium has two hyperfine states, uh, F equals three and F equals four, and they're separated by, by about 9.2 gigahertz, and by international agreement, uh, this separation has a defined frequency, which means just that the hyperfine frequency of the cesium atom defines what we mean by a second. So a second is defined to be a certain number of oscillations of this, uh, uh, of this hyperfine frequency exactly. Uh, so if you want to make a clock that uh, realizes the SI second, then you have to use cesium. So, and in this atomic beam apparatus, you've got a, uh, uh, a cesium oven. You heat up the cesium, it vaporizes. Uh, one of the reasons why cesium was the choice was because you don't have to heat it very much to get it uh, to have a decent vapor pressure. Uh, it's really heavy, so that um, uh, at any given temperature, the velocity is rather slow. So you make a collimated atomic beam that goes along here. And uh, various kinds of methods states like the atoms, so in the, they're in the lower hyperfine state, not just the lower hyperfine state, but the m equals zero state of f equals three. Why m equals zero? Because m equals zero is not sensitive in first order to uh, the magnetic field. It doesn't have any uh, magnetic moment, and so at near zero field, it's got zero slope with the magnetic field. As you turn on the magnetic field, it mixes with other states, and it develops some, uh, some sensitivity to the field, but first order, it's insensitive. 
the clock transition, while it in fact doesn't say so in the, um, in the official definition, is between the n equals 0 state of f equals 3 and the n equals 0 state of f equals 4. So you select the atoms so that they're all in the n equals 0 state of f equals 3. Then the atoms go through a microwave cavity. The microwave cavity is tuned uh, very closely to this uh, hyperfine transition. And in passing through the microwave cavity, which is, is fed by some crystal control uh, microwave oscillator, the atoms experience in their rest frame a pulse of microwave radiation. So uh, the power in the cavity and the uh, uh, length of time for the atoms at some typical velocity is adjusted such that uh, the atoms experience uh, pretty closely a pi over 2 pulse. Now when I say that, does everybody understand what I mean when I say a pi over 2 pulse? How many people understand what I mean when I say a pi over 2 pulse? Okay, so not everybody. Okay, so uh, how many people understand the, uh, the block vector and the block sphere? Okay, so not everybody. Okay, so here's... Uh, Okay, so in the block picture, we, uh, which is appropriate for a two-level atom, we will represent the quantum state of the atom by the position of a vector on a human sphere. Now, when the atom is in, the, let's say, the ground state, we'll have the vector pointing down, so that it's at the, pointing toward the south pole. And when the vector, when the state is in the excited state, we'll have the vector pointing up to the north pole. If it's in a superposition of uh, those two states, then that means that it's pointing somewhere else on the sphere, and the uh, uh, the height uh, uh, above the south pole will be a measure of what the fraction of the superposition is, how much is in the ground state, how much is in the excited state. If it's at the equator, then it means you've got an equal fraction in the ground state and the excited state, and the phase, that is the angle around here, the longitude, is going to be uh, what the phase of the superposition is, because you know when I specify what a superposition is, I've got to specify the phase difference between the two states. You know, so it'll be something like uh, the state might be uh, f equals three plus uh, f equals four plus e to the i phi times f equals four divided by square root two would be a, a normalized state. So the position on this block sphere. Is, is a complete representation of what the, uh, the quantum state of a two-level uh, two system is. Now, uh, so you start with things in the, uh, in, in the blue state, the F three state, that means the vector is pointing down. The microwave field <coughs> will uh, induce a coherent transition uh, to the excited state, and that can be represented as being a rotation of this block vector from being down to being up. Well, if it goes halfway to here, that's a pi over 2 pulse, because the angle changed by pi over 2. That's why it's called a pi over 2 pulse. It goes all the way up to pi pulse. Okay? So if pi over 2 pulse puts it into an equal superposition of the two states. Okay? And the phase of that superposition will depend on the phase of the microwave. Okay. So the first, uh, the first cavity puts the atoms into a superposition of those two states. Now. Since it's in a superposition of those two states, it's not in an ion state of the Hamiltonian. That means the state evolves. And in the block vector picture, what that means is the block vector is rotating around at the frequency of the, uh, uh, of the difference between these two states. Okay, I shouldn't have done that so many times. I'm feeling a little dizzy. <laughs> um, so uh, that's the ticking of the clock, is the uh, rotation of the uh, of a block vector in, uh, uh, in that horizontal plane. That's, that's the, the nine, that it ticks at the approximately 9.2 gigahertz. Now, in this Ramsey uh, method of separated oscillatory fields, um, the idea is that the, the atom's block vector is rotating around like this. Okay? In the microwave cavity, there's a microwave field, there's a magnetic field associated with the, that microwave field, and that microwave field is rotating around as well. Now, if it's rotating at exactly the same uh, rate as the, as the atom is, then what will happen in the second region is that this block vector, which was in the, 
on the equator will continue then by the second field to be rotated up and everything will be in the excited state. But if the phase of the microwave field and the phase of the, um, of the uh, atom's block vector become out of phase uh, by, by pi, then what's going to happen is the block vector will rotate back down to the, uh, to the ground state. And so depending upon how much phase accumulates between the uh, block vector and the microwave field, which we zero if the microwave field is exactly the right frequency, but if it's not, then there will be some phase accumulation, then you will get more or less of the excited state. When you're right on resonance, you'll get the maximum of the excited state. And uh, this, uh, uh, this process of separating the, the, the two interaction regions was what won Norman Ramsey the Nobel Prize in 1989 uh, he invented in 1949, so it was a little bit of a lag. Um, and all atomic clocks uh, use this, this method, which is called the Ramsey uh, method of separating all fields. How accurate when you make the pi over 2 rotation? How, how accurately? Yeah. Is it, well, this is the great thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really change anything. If it's a little bit less or a little bit more than pi over 2, and it will be, because these atoms have all. Uh, uh, different velocities. Some of them going faster will have a little bit less than pi over 2. Some of them going a little slower will have a little bit more than pi over 2 because they're staying in the microwave field longer. But it doesn't matter. Uh, the key thing is that when the phases, when the frequencies of, of the block vector oscillation and the microwave oscillation are identical, then you get a maximum. Now, if you make it hugely long, like you make pi instead of pi over 2, you won't get much signal. So the only thing that, that um, uh, the, uh, the actual pulse area uh, matters for is what the signal noise is. So it's best if it's pi over 2, because that means it will go halfway on the first one, all the way on the second one, and then you'll get the, big, the biggest signal. But if it's not perfect, it doesn't really matter. And it's a good thing, because it's not so easy to get it perfect. Uh, it's hard to get the pulse area of anything for any kind of experiment better than uh, within 1% of, of what you want. I mean, if you're really hard, you can do a little bit better than 1%. So it's a good thing that it doesn't, that it doesn't matter too much. OK, so that's, uh, uh, that's the standard way of making atomic clocks. Uh, with an atomic beam, is, it, it was the standard way of making atomic clocks before laser cooling. It's still what you'll get if you buy an atomic clock from Agilent. Uh, this is what you'll get. Now, the resonance width, that is the, the full width and half max of the, of the signal that you get out, which is the, uh, the number of atoms in the excited state versus the frequency of the drive, that's going to have a line width that goes like 1 over the transit time. Sort of obviously, the longer the time is, the longer time you have to wind up phase. So if there's a frequency difference, you're going to wind up more phase. So that means that the line width is going to go like 1 over the transit time. So that means that the longer the transit time is, the better a measurement you can make because your line width is smaller. So that's a good thing. But these atoms are moving at uh, uh, something more than 100 meters per second. And in, in the longest of these apparatuses, this distance is about 100, uh, it's about, well, it's 100 centimeters, about a meter. So that means that this, um, this uh, in time, between here and here, it's some, uh, some milliseconds. So the typical line width is on the order of 100 hertz. These things operate at a, uh, at a, uh, a relative uh, inaccuracy of 10 to the minus 14. And the frequency is about 10 to the 10. So that means that you want to measure what the frequency is to 10 to the minus 4 hertz. And the line width is 100 hertz. So you see what the problem is? You've got to know where the center of the line is to within 1 1 millionth of its line width. That's not easy. But they do it, nevertheless. Uh, so obviously, if the line width was smaller, that would be easier. So you'd like to have longer time. And that's one of the reasons why you'd like to have slower atoms. It was one of the original motivations for doing laser cooling, so that you'd have more time. OK, but that's not the end of it. First order doctor shift. When uh, something is moving, uh, and you look at its frequency, you will see it different by uh, the uh, 
ratio of its velocity toward you, the component of its velocity toward you, now let's see, oh, that's, that's a picture of Ramsey. Let me just say that again. Ramsey, uh, what a great physicist he was. He just died in uh, this, this, this past November. There's a picture of him with uh, an atomic beam apparatus uh, uh, back in 1952. Uh, but anyway, the point that I want to make is that uh, if you've got these atoms uh, moving, which they are, then you will experience a first order Doppler shift. And that, uh, okay, so here's, uh, uh, okay, so we already talked about this, about the line width. Uh, there's also this first order Doppler shift, and that goes like, um, uh, like V over C. Now, the velocity is uh, more than 100 meters per second. If it were 300 meters per second, that would be a part in a million. Okay, it's a little bit less than that. A part in a million. We're trying to do a part in 10 to the 14. So uh, that means you've got to do another eight orders of magnitude. You've got to, whatever you've got as an error, you've got to correct it by eight orders of magnitude. That's not easy, but they do. Uh, because there's all sorts of tricks to make the Doppler effect go away, to make it essentially Doppler free. Uh, the fact that you use a microwave cavity so that there's an equal amount of microwave going in one direction as the other, as the other is one of the main reasons why uh, this thing works so well. But those cavities are never perfect. You never have, have perfectly the same amount of microwave power going one way as going the other, and that's one of the key problems in not getting rid of this, uh, of this first order Doppler effect. Then there's the second order Doppler effect, or the relativistic time dilation. So uh, that goes like one half b squared over c squared. That's on the order of parts in 10 to the 13. So that isn't so bad, but it means in order to get to a part in 10 to the 14, you've got to correct it by almost 1%. Well, that doesn't sound so bad, but the only way to correct it is to measure the velocity distribution of the atoms and then uh, apply a calculated correction. It's not that easy to measure the velocity distribution well enough that you can make the correction to uh, to 1%. And there's no second order Doppler free technique that, you, that uh, you can use. So all of these things, the fact that the line width is big, the fact that you've got Doppler shifts and relativistic time dilations, all of these things limit the performance of these uh, atomic clocks to on the order of uh, part 10 to 14. The very best of them achieved, uh, I think, five parts of 10 to the 15. But they just couldn't get any better because of the motion of the atoms. So that's why people became interested in doing laser cooling back in the 1970s. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about today is laser cooling, which is reducing the velocity spread, not just the velocity, but the velocity spread uh, of, uh, of the atoms. And I'm going to be talking about trapping, uh, which is confining the atoms using laser uh, fields or other electromagnetic fields, usually magnetic fields. Now, one of the things that those of you who saw the lecture last night, uh, I hope understood as a result of all those balloons going into the liquid nitrogen, uh, is that ordinary refrigeration is not going to work. You can't cool down your cesium atoms by using a refrigerator, because then you won't have any gas. And uh, it turns out that at the kinds of temperatures that we achieve with laser cooling, the vapor pressure of any substance at all, doesn't matter what the substance is, the vapor pressure of any substance would be less than one atom per cubic universe. Okay? So, the, so, so there's, you're, you're never going to get uh, uh, atoms to use for your atomic clock by refrigeration and, and having things in equilibrium. You've got to do something else, and that something else is laser cooling. Okay, so in order to understand laser cooling, I'm going to start by talking about radiative forces. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I think you've already heard some of this before, but now you'll hear it from, uh, from a slightly different perspective. We usually divide radiative forces into two kinds of forces, and I know that Hanfu talked about this as well. Uh, what some people call the scattering force, I think he called it the spontaneous force, uh, or just radiation pressure. And this arises because uh, you have light coming in. Uh, each photon has h bar omega energy and has h bar k, where k is 2 pi over lambda uh, of momentum. And when the atom absorbs that light, it gets a kick equal to this uh, the momentum of the photon. And when it radiates the light, it radiates in a random direction, 
random with respect to, uh, to any plane through the atom. There will be as much probability of radiation in one direction as in the other. It's not isotropic, but, uh, but it's symmetric. So that the net force due to the radiation is, uh, is zero on average. So that means that the average force is equal to the scattering rate times the momentum of the photon divided by the mass of the atom. Okay, just F equals ma. So that's the, the scattering force. And it's called the scattering force because it results from the scattering of, uh, of photons uh, due to spontaneous emission. The other kind of force is sometimes called the dipole force or the stimulating force or the gradient force. Fundamentally, this force results uh, because you've got more than one plane wave, therefore more than one momentum for the photons. So one of the things that can happen is that the atoms can absorb light from one of the plane waves and be stimulated to emit into the other plane wave. And through a process that does not involve spontaneous emission, the atoms change their momentum by exchanging photons between one wave and another. Now, I've drawn this as if there are two plane waves, and that's often the situation, that you have two plane waves, two, say, counter-propagating beams, a very common configuration. But it doesn't have to be like that. It could simply be a focused laser beam. Uh, if I want to express a focused laser beam in terms of plane waves, then I have to do some sum over an infinite number of plane waves that have different momentum. And uh, I can think of the dipole force that arises from that kind of configuration as being uh, absorption from one of those plane waves and emission into another one of those plane waves. We don't usually do it that way, and I'm going to present you with other ways of thinking about it, but you could think about it that way, and that's one of the reasons why it's called uh, the stimulated force. Um, it's called the gradient force because it only occurs if there is a gradient of the intensity of the light. The only light field that doesn't have a gradient of intensity is a plane wave. All other light fields will have a gradient of intensity. The interference between two plane waves produces a gradient of the intensity, a standing wave. A focused laser beam obviously has a gradient of intensity because there is a, a variation of the intensity across the laser beam. So you only get this force when there is a gradient of the intensity, so sometimes it's called the gradient force. It's called the dipole force because of uh, another way of thinking about it, which I'm going to show you after I tell you about this slide. While we often divide uh, these gradient forces into the scattering force or, or spontaneous force, the dipole force, or the stimulated force, and usually that division is quite clear, there are some cases that are ambiguous as to whether you should call them dipole forces or uh, spontaneous forces and can in fact be viewed as arising from either one. And I just say that as a warning to let you know that it's not always completely unambiguous which kind of force you're talking about. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, well, okay, I'll talk about the dipole force a little bit later. I thought it was going to be coming up here. Let's talk about uh, the scattering force here and the scattering of light from two level atom. So here's a two level atom, ground state and excited state, absorbs a photon, emits a photon in some random direction. And just as before, uh, we have the average force is equal to the rate of scattering times the, uh, the momentum of the photon. Now, what is the rate of scattering? Uh, so the rate of scattering is gamma, where gamma is the decay rate of the population of the excited state. In other words, it's the rate at which photons are emitted if the atom is in the excited state. Uh, divided by two. That's the, gamma divided by two is the fastest scattering rate you could have if you uh, have uh, infinite intensity right on resonance, that's the highest scattering rate you can have because it saturates the two level atom. So you have half of the population in the ground state, half in the excited state. So with half the population in the excited state, you radiate at gamma over two. Okay, so that's the, that's the maximum it could be. And then this term, which is the Lorentzian term, uh, tells you how it's gonna vary as a function of the intensity of the light and the, um, the detuning for resonance. So I've written this Lorentzian in a slightly different way from what you've seen before to emphasize some points. In the numerator, you have the intensity. That's the, uh, I is the intensity of the light. I naught 
is sometimes called the saturation intensity. It's, the, it's defined in this way. Uh, when the ratio of I over, uh, well, the ratio of I over I naught is defined to be equal to twice the square of the Rabi frequency divided by the square of the natural decay rate. Now, the Rabi frequency, I know you've talked about the Rabi frequency, but let me say exactly what the Rabi frequency is. Remember the block vector picture, where when you're in the ground state, you're down, when you're in the excited state, you're up. When I apply uh, a field that couples the ground state to the excited state, what happens is this block vector rotates from being down to being up. And if I keep that field on, it'll just keep rotating around. Okay? The, the rotation frequency of that block vector is the Rabi frequency. Okay? Sometimes, some very few people who ought to be shot will define the Rabi frequency differently. They will define it as the frequency for this thing to go around twice. And the reason being that the sign of the wave function changes when it goes around once. But who cares? The thing's back in the ground state. So uh, I think those people who sometimes define the Rabi frequency differently are known as theorists. <laughs> <laughs> but you would never do that, right? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the thing in the numerator is this normalized intensity. It also appears in the denominator as a term that uh, shows up as what we call power broadening. The higher the intensity of the light, the bigger the line width of the transition. Now, um, uh, this is the term that's the frequency dependent term, and I've also written this in a, in a normalized way. The normalized detuning from resonance, delta is the detuning from resonance, omega minus omega naught, where omega naught is the resonant frequency, omega is the frequency of the field that's driving this two level system. So the normalized detuning is 2 delta divided by gamma, and the reason is that when you're off resonance by by half gamma, half the, uh, uh, the, the decay rate, then in the low intensity limit, the rate of scattering will have dropped by a factor of two. Which means that, uh, that, that's, where, that that's what's sometimes called the half power point. It also shows you that the full width at half maximum is, the, uh, is gamma. Okay? Uh, now, you can see that if I've got a large I over I naught, so I've got this big term in the numerator, then I've got to change delta by more in order to reduce the, uh, uh, the value of this whole function by a factor of two. And that's why this is called the, the power drop. Okay? So, um, let's see, is there anything on here that... Uh, that I want to call your attention to besides that. Okay, okay that, I think that's fine. Now, let me make an aside here. Uh, the thing that we've called the saturation intensity, I naught, which is defined that way, is not the only choice that people make. It is relatively common for people to make this choice, to call I over I sat the ratio of the squares of omega uh, and gamma instead of twice that. Now, um, I mean, this is a quite natural uh, uh, choice. Uh, this one is also a natural choice because uh, <coughs> this choice uh, is such that when you have the uh, intensity equal to uh, I naught, then the contribution to the power broadening is equal to the contribution from the natural decay. So that's a, a natural choice as well. But this is obviously a natural choice uh, uh, also, so and both are made. It's just one of those things to watch out for. When somebody tells you that what the saturation intensity is, make sure you know what they mean. By that. Okay, so that's the scattering force. Uh, uh, you just have to know what the photon momentum is, what the rate of scattering is. That gives you the scattering force. How about the dipole force? Well, this sort of explains why it's called the dipole force. If I had a um, uh, a dipole moment, electric dipole moment, in an electric field, there would be an energy associated with that dipole moment, mu dot e, actually minus mu dot e. Okay, so that's, I'm calling that w. Now, uh, if I've got a laser field, then the laser field can be written uh, in this way at some uh, particular point in space, some e naught times cosine of omega t. Now, uh, I can think of the dipole moment of the atom 
as being uh, the charge of the electron times the position of the, uh, of the electron, and that can be a function of time. Now let's take as a model for the atom a harmonically bound charge, something we often do. It's, uh, it's often a, a good enough model, and uh, there are many times when it's a really bad model. But for this, let's just imagine that, uh, that the atom is a harmonically bound charge, and so there's some resonant frequency omega naught, and here's the equation of motion for a harmonically bound charge that is driven by an electric field that has this form. So uh, obviously the force on the electric charge is just the charge times the electric field. So uh, on, on the driving side of this harmonic oscillator equation, I've got that force divided by the mass to make it all in units of acceleration. And you've done this when you were children. Uh, you solved the harmonic oscillator. Uh, and without any damping, this is the solution for the, the harmonic oscillator. That the, um, uh, the position of the harmonically bound uh, object being driven uh, in this uh, uh, periodic way is going to have this, uh, this form. It, uh, it follows the drive, cos cosine omega t, and has this resonant uh, form where it blows up when uh, omega is equal to omega naught. And the important thing here that I want to uh, uh, point out in order for, for this calculation is the fact that the phase of the oscillation changes as you go through resonance. And you already knew that, right? So when I'm below resonance, which is to say omega is less than omega naught, that means that the position uh, oscillation is in phase with the driving force. So when I'm below resonance, I'm in phase because this will be positive, and this was the phase of the driving force, okay? Now, if I'm <coughs> above resonance, that is to say, if omega is bigger than omega naught, then this term is negative, and that means I'm 180 degrees out of phase, okay? So, below resonance, I'm in phase, and above resonance, I'm 180 degrees out of phase. Now, that means, when I look at this energy, see, this, uh, uh, response of the harmonically bound charge gives me an oscillating electric dipole moment that is either in phase or out of phase with the driving field, depending on whether I'm below resonance or above resonance. Now, if I'm close to resonance or on resonance, then I can't use this simple approach. I have to put in the damping. And as you know, the phase goes continuously between being in phase and out of phase as you go through resonance. But I'm only interested in what happens when I'm very far uh, below resonance or very far above resonance. Then I'm just either uh, one or minus one multiplying the uh, this dipole moment. So this dipole moment is going to be oscillating either in phase or out of phase with the driving field. And that means when I calculate the energy, I'm going to have uh, uh, a term that is uh, not time dependent because when I multiply a cosine of omega t times a cosine of omega t, uh, multiply it out, there's going to be terms that don't depend on time. And those terms will be positive, but this thing here will be negative if the, the oscillation of the electron and the, and the drive are in phase. So that means the energy, when I'm below resonance, is going to be <coughs> negative. Okay? Now, <coughs> the energy also obviously depends upon the electric field, because uh, uh, it's got the electric field here, and mu also has the electric field in it because the harder you drive, the bigger the dipole moment. So that means that this is going to be proportional to E squared, so, and E squared is proportional to the intensity of the light, right? So that means the higher the intensity of the light, the bigger this negative energy is. So that means the atoms want to be at the place where the light is most intense, when it's tuned below resonance. Everything is the opposite when it's tuned above resonance. Then this um, uh, the sign of this thing is negative. This energy is positive, and the atoms will be expelled from the region of highest intensity when you're above resonance. So this is why uh, this stimulated force is sometimes called the dipole force because there's an induced dipole moment in the atom. That induced dipole interacts with the field that created it in the first place to have an energy. The gradient of that energy in space is a force, because that's always the way it is, right? A force is the gradient of an energy. 
great inner potential. And, uh, uh, and, and so that's why we call it the dipole force. Okay? Uh, now, there's another way. This is a beautiful way of thinking about it. And you've seen this already, but I'm going to go through it again. Because I remember the first time that I heard Claude Cotin and he talk about the, the dress down picture, I was completely confused. And it was about maybe the fourth time that I heard him talk about it that I understood it. And so I'm guessing that if you heard about the dress down picture for the first time in Han Pu's lecture, then it won't hurt for you to hear it again. <clears throat> but this is a, such a beautiful way of thinking about, uh, uh, about the interaction of atoms with light. Okay, so let's say that I've got an atom, a two-level atom. Here it is, ground and excited state. And let's say I also have a laser beam. And uh, here I'm, I'm drawing what the energy of the atom is, and I'm also drawing what the energy of the, the laser field is. So the energy levels of the atom, just ground and excited, the energy levels of the light field are, uh, depends on how many photons are in the light field. Each photon has an energy of h bar omega laser. And so there's a, uh, an infinite ladder of possible energies depending on how many uh, <coughs> uh, photons there are in the laser field. And I'm free to choose the zero of this energy any place I want. So let me choose it uh, to be at the same place as the ground state when there are n photons in the field. So that means there's an energy state of the laser field that's uh, h bar omega laser above the, uh, the ground state, that's uh, above uh, this state, that's when I've got n plus one photons in the field. And there's an energy state down here that's h bar omega below uh, this uh, uh, chosen zero of energy state, that's when I've got n minus one photons in the field. Now, let me just draw a joint uh, energy level diagram that counts both the energy of the light and the energy of the atom, but does not take into account the fact that there might be some interaction between the atom and the light. That's an easy physical situation to uh, imagine. I have an atom here, I have a laser field over here, they don't interact, but I'm perfectly free to count their energies together. So that's what this <coughs> energy level diagram is. So uh, down here, there is an energy level that corresponds to the atom being in the ground state and having n photons in the laser field. There's also an energy state that's nearby that corresponds to the atom being in the excited state and there being n minus 1 photons in the laser field. And it's a little bit lower than the ground state with n photons because the laser frequency, the way I've drawn this, is a little bit above the resonant frequency of the atom. So subtracting one photon from the field and exciting the atom reduces the energy by a little bit. The amount by which it reduces the energy is what we call the detuning for resonance, the difference between the laser frequency and the atom frequency. Okay? And then if I go up by one laser frequency, I've got another pair of states that looks just like the one down here that corresponds to ground state plus n plus one and, and n plus one photons, or excited state with n photons. And they're also separated by the detuning. And there's an infinite ladder of such states. Now let's turn on the interaction between the atoms. So now in my picture, I just move the atom into the laser field. And now I've got to uh, re-diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And it's a simple 2 by 2 Hamiltonian with an interaction term that is uh, equal to h bar times the Rabi frequency. Okay, And then you do that. Uh, 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 you know, even I can diagonalize a 2 by 2 matrix. And uh, you find new eigenvalues, and those eigenvalues are split by the square root of delta squared plus omega squared. They're always split because whenever I've got an interaction between two levels, it always pushes them apart. It's one of the things you, one of the first things you learn in quantum mechanics, okay? <laughs> okay, now this, you see that that, uh, that splitting is always at least delta, and the bigger the interaction between the atoms is, the bigger the splitting is. This is sometimes called the generalized Rabi frequency. Why? Because if the detuning is zero, which <coughs> is the situation that I was describing with this rotating lock record, you know, that starts here and rotates up to, to the excited state, that's when the when the, the that, that's what happens when the, the detuning is zero. And then the frequency of rotation is equal to the Rabi frequency. But what if the what if the frequency <coughs> Uh, was not tuned to resonance. The block picture is wonderful for doing that as well. If I'm not at resonance, 
then uh, what I do is I uh, imagine that there is a uh, another field, a fictitious field, that uh, in addition to the driving field, which is in the horizontal plane, there's another field that is in the vertical direction. So what I didn't tell you in those Robbie pictures is the way I think about the Robbie oscillation is that there is a magnetic field, because this was a magnetic system, that's in the horizontal plane. When I go into the rotating frame, rotating with that rotating field, which goes along like this, I now go into the rotating frame, so it's fixed. I've got this magnetic moment that's pointing down, right? And it rotates around this magnetic moment, because that's what magnetic moments do. They rotate around the magnetic field. And that's how I get the Robbie frequency. Well, if I'm not on resonance, then this thing isn't in the horizontal plane. It's either down or up, depending upon whether I'm uh, uh, above or below resonance. And I rotate around that. And it's bigger, because I get it by adding a field uh, that's either up or down. That makes the vector longer, so the rotation frequency is faster. And I have them vectorially there, there uh, uh, at right angles to each other, so that's why the delta squared plus omega squared term. Okay? And I rotate around that new vector, and what it means is that since it's not in the horizontal plane, when I rotate around it, I don't get all the way up to the excited state. Okay? So when you're not on resonance, it can't drive something perfectly up to the excited state. So that's why it's called the generalized Robbie frequency, because it's still the frequency at which the block vector rotates. It's just not going all the way up to the excited state. OK, so, so this is the new uh, 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 set of energy levels that you've got when you, when you uh, uh, re-diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And you see it's uh, also uh, a ladder of <coughs> pairs of states. But we can no longer label these states as being ground state and a certain number of photons because they represent superpositions. Remember when you, whenever you uh, add a term to your Hamiltonian and then re-diagonalize, the new eigenstates are not, obviously, the old eigenstates. The new eigenstates are superpositions of the old eigenstates. And so this thing, which connects to the ground state, has both ground state and excited state character. It's going to be predominantly ground state uh, but when the coupling is really big, it's going to be about half and half. And the same way with the excited state. At low coupling, it'll be mostly excited state, but at high coupling, it'll be about half and half. Also, this state has an indefinite number of photons. I've labeled it by n, but in fact, it's a superposition of having n photons and having n plus 1 photons. Okay? But just for lack of, of uh, a better... Uh, uh, index, I've labeled it as, as, as n. So th these are the dress states. Okay? Now, we've ignored uh, the, uh, the decay of the states in drawing this picture. And in fact, this picture is valid. It's a good picture when these couplings, when the coupling strength or the detuning is bigger than the decay rate, then this is a valid picture. When it's not, this isn't such a useful picture. So this is going to be something good for when either the detuning or the uh, uh, coupling strength, omega, is, uh, is much bigger than the, uh, than the decay rate. Spontaneous emission occurs, nevertheless, and in fact establishes what the equilibrium populations of these states are. And spontaneous emission can be thought of as being a spontaneous decay from one of these states to one of these states. And, uh, Anybody tell you about the, the Malo triplet? Does, how many people know what the Malo triplet is? Nobody. Wow. Okay, so I can't resist. This age is us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this tells us how old we are, but we still know the Malo triplet. Oh, you don't think people learn about Malo triplets today? It's so wonderful. No, I don't think they do. Okay, so, so I can't resist telling you about the Malo triplet. Because when I was a boy, it was a big deal. You know what I mean? It, it just about nobody had it confirmed that it was really true, and now it's commonplace or commonplace you don't even know about. Okay, so let's say that I've got an atom and I, uh, I shine laser light on it and the laser is extremely narrow, much narrower than the, um, uh, than the, uh, the line width of the atomic transition. I shine light on the atom and I look at the spectrum of light that is scattered from the atom. What will it be? Uh, well, what it will be is it will be a double function because 
that's the only thing you've got. You're driving the, uh, the atom with this, uh, this single frequency laser beam, and it radiates at that frequency. You can also think of it as energy conservation. You're putting in photons that have a certain frequency, they're coming back out, and they have to have that same frequency. If I ignore a recoil, and let's imagine that I've got the atom trapped or something, so I'd like to ignore a recoil. That's a perfectly good picture as long as the intensity of the light is low. And this is what I think everybody thought until probably sometime in the middle of the 20th century. If you look in Heitler's book on quantum uh, uh, optics, that's what it says. So now let's crank up the intensity of the light so that uh, uh, these, uh, these dress uh, pictures are the right one. Let's say that I'm in this dress state. There are three, actually there are four different transitions that could, could occur. You could go from two uh, n plus one to one n. That's the lowest energy transition you could make. You could go from one n plus one to two n. That's the highest uh, transition you could make. Or you could go from one n plus one to one n. That's, the, uh, that's in the middle. And in fact, that's a transition that has a frequency equal to the laser frequency. Or you could go from 2n plus 1 to 2n, has the same frequency. It's just a different, uh, different transition on here. So there's going to be three different frequencies radiated by the atoms. That's the model of triplet. And each of those things is going to have a width. It's going to have a width that's approximately equal to the natural decay width of these, uh, uh, of these states. And in addition to that, there's going to be this double function thing that comes from uh, the, uh, this energy conserving uh, scattering. So there's actually four components of the spectrum that you will get when you drive the atom with a, uh, a strong field. And uh, there's this model triplet, uh, and then there's this, this double function component. And you know, when I was, uh, was a graduate student, Nobody had seen this, but it had been predicted, and uh, uh, people were wondering whether this was really what was going on. Now it's routine, it's easy to, to see this, we see it all the time. Uh, but um, uh, it's easy to see why you should get that by looking at this dressed atom picture. The way Model did it was really hard. He used correlation functions, <laughs> <laughs> which are wonderful tools, but experimentalists get scared by them. So, uh, so this dressed atom picture just falls, the model falls out. But if you want it quantitatively, then you can have to do the calculation with the uh, correlation. It's yes. the same thing as when you study resonance for resonance with all those correlation functions. Yeah, exactly. This is, it is resonance for essence. This is exactly resonance for essence. And the double function is the low intensity limit of resonance for essence. And the model triplet is the high intensity limit. And interestingly, as you crank up the intensity more and more, you get less and less of the double function. Okay. Now, here's, here's the reason why I talked, uh, I told you about the dressed atom picture, is because it will give us the dipole force. So let's imagine that I have a laser that has a, an intensity profile as, as a function of position that looks like this. This is your standard laser beam. It's got some kind of a Gaussian profile. And here are the dressed uh, states as a function of position. So what I'm doing as I go along here is changing the Rabi frequency. So out here, where uh, the atom doesn't see any light, then I've just got the bare states. Uh, uh, ground state n plus 1, excited state uh, n. Okay? But as I move the atom into the laser, I'm sorry, into the laser beam, then there's a splitting, and that splitting becomes uh, equal to delta squared plus omega squared square root. Uh, wherever uh, the intensity gives you this value of omega. Obviously, it's maximum where uh, the intensity is maximum, and so the splitting between these two lines is maximum where the, uh, where the intensity is maximum. Now, where is the population? This is the state that corresponds to the ground state, and therefore its population is going to be, that it, its character is mostly ground state, and of course, since the atom is always decaying to the ground state, the population of this state, the one that adiabatically connects to the ground state, is going to be higher than the population of the one that adiabatically connects to the excited state, right? Because if I 
if I allow this thing to reach equilibrium and I go out here, it's all going to be in the ground state. None of it will be in the excited state because there's no light. So that means more of the population is going to be in this state, the one on top, than the one on the bottom. When the detuning is above residence, look at the order of these states. Gn plus 1 is above E. That means the detuning is bigger than 0. So that means most of the population is here. So most of the population of the clown sees a potential hill uh, at the laser beam, so it will be forced away. Some of the population, of course, will be forced down, but what you're going to be looking at is the average force. The average has to be done carefully, and I just warned you about that, that uh, you want to find out how to make sure that you do the average correctly, just read uh, the paper by uh, Cohen, Tanucci, and Dalibar uh, about, about this. But, but qualitatively, you can see that on average, the atom is going to be forced away from the region of highest intensity, and that's what we said was going to be the case when delta was greater than zero. When delta is less than zero, everything's reversed. It's the upper state that's the one that connects to uh, the excited state. The, the lower state is the one that connects to the ground state. And so for detunings less than zero, the average force is going to be pushing the atoms toward the region of highest intensity, which is what we also uh, discovered by looking at the uh, at the response of a driven dipole. And uh, this population, how much is here and how much is here, is established by spontaneous emission, the kind of thing that produces the model trip. Uh, now, let's look at a particular limit. When the uh, detuning is very large compared to the, uh, the Rabi frequency. In fact, let me show it on this slide. So if the detuning is big and the maximum Rabi frequency is relatively small, then we can make a, uh, 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 we make a calculation of what the, this, uh, uh, what the splitting is. So the splitting is equal to uh, delta plus the um, amount by which this thing is depressed. And that uh, is given by the generalized Rabi frequency square root of the general, well, the generalized Rabi frequency is delta square plus omega squared square root minus the detuning tells you what this dip is. Okay, and I've just written that there. And then taking the uh, small omega approximation, you can just multiply this out, uh, you get that this dip is equal to omega squared over 4 delta. So that's omega squared over 4 delta, which is what you learned already is what we call the light shift. So the amount by which the ground state is depressed, or for that matter, the excited state is, uh, is raised is equal to this quantity omega squared over 4 delta, and that's the light shift. And this is just an easy way of getting the light shift. You can also get it by doing a perturbation treatment of the, uh, uh, of the interaction of the light with the atom. So, uh, uh, if you tune very far off the resonance, that's how deep your trap will be. It'll be equal to the light shift. But if you're close to resonance, then it's something else. Uh, now, this is a very common way of making a trap for atoms. You just take a laser beam and focus it. There is an absolute maximum of the intensity at the center of the focus. It's a maximum in this direction because of the transverse profile of the laser beam. It's a maximum in this direction because it's focused. So all you have to do is, uh, is focus a laser beam, and uh, it makes an atom trap. This was, in fact, the first laser trap was exactly this, a single focused laser beam focused inside a cloud of cold atoms. It was done in, I think, 1986 by Steve Chu and, and his colleagues Art Ashkin and uh, John Bjorkholm and maybe some others. So, uh, so this is very commonly used trap, still used today. Often what people do is they take two of these focused laser beams and cross them. And the reason for that is that typically when you focus a laser beam down like this, the distance over which the intensity drops to zero in this direction is much smaller than the distance over which it drops to zero in this direction. And that's going to be true unless you focus this thing with an incredibly high numerical aperture or an incredibly small F number. In other words, unless this focusing angle is extremely steep. And usually you can't do that. So uh, in order to compensate for the fact that the tracking force is weak along this direction, people just add another laser beam you know, along along another direction so that you get a stronger uh, trapping force.
course. And it's pretty common to have what we call crossed beam dipole traps to make the trap stiff in, uh, in all directions. And typically, these traps are tuned very far from resonance, so far from resonance that we can ignore the spontaneous emission. Why is it possible to do that? Because the rate of spontaneous emission goes down like the square of the detuning from resonance, whereas the light shift only goes down like one over the detuning from resonance. And that means if you've got enough money to buy a bigger laser, you just tune the laser further from resonance and crank up the power, and you can keep the trap depth the same and make the spontaneous emission go away uh, as one over the detuning. So you can make the, uh, the spontaneous emission negligible. And that's the way most traps today work. Back in the early days, uh, people made laser traps that weren't so far from resonance, and then they scattered a lot of light, and these were traps that were not really uh, completely conservative in the sense that, uh, that they didn't heat the atoms. Nevertheless, as I think you learned from Han Fu, the optical dipole potential is nevertheless a potential that is derivable from, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's a force, the optical dipole force is a force that's derivable from a potential. That potential, nevertheless, has fluctuations that cause heat. So it's a little bit of a strange thing. It looks like a conservative force because it's derivable from a potential, but there are fluctuations in the force that cause the thing to heat. Today, we usually work so far from resonance that we can ignore the fluctuations. But not always, sometimes you have to worry about it. Um, well, that's what I say on this slide. <laughs> uh, uh, rotating wave approximation. Let's well, forget about that. We've got a lot of stuff to do. Um, okay, so now let's stop for questions. Uh, this is sort of a summary, a uh, very brief summary of what I talked about, the Ramsey method, uh, motional effects on clocks, and the nature of radiative forces, spontaneous uh, uh, force, radiation pressure, and dipole. Uh, force uh, the dress out of the light shift, dipole traps. So if you've got any questions about this stuff uh, before I go on, this will be a good time to, uh, to stop and, uh, and do that. Don't be shy. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? So for early Ramsey-type experiments you showed, uh, the velocity distribution, would it, would it typically expand an octet, for instance, and you would, were you still able to decode the signal? Yeah. So let me, let me just go back to that, uh, although I'm not sure that the picture will help too much. Okay, so the question is, what about the velocity distribution? Typically, this velocity distribution will be a, uh, a typical thermal effusive velocity distribution. It'll go like v cubed, v to the minus uh, v squared. And that is something that has a width that is about equal to its peak velocity. So this is a hugely wide uh, velocity distribution. What that means is that uh, uh, there's a huge variation in the, uh, uh, the area of the pulse that the atoms get passing through each one of these microwave cavities. So uh, it turns out that on resonance, it, it doesn't matter. It just changes the signal noise a little bit. It, what it means is that, that when this microwave field is resonant with the uh, uh, with the atom, then all of the atoms, no matter what their, their velocity that go through here, will experience the maximum uh, population of the excited state for whatever Robbie frequency they have. But things are very different when we go to a frequency that is different uh, from the resonant frequency by enough so that some of the atoms let's say the ones that have uh, the most probable velocity, will experience one extra uh, rotation of the block vector. So that should put them back in, in resonance again, right? And if the atoms all have the same velocity, then if you uh, just change the frequency such that for this uh, uh, interaction time, the, uh, the block vector makes one extra rotation than the microwave field, it's fine. Everything will go into the excited state again. But because not all the atoms have the same velocity, some of them have uh, uh, a little bit more than, than uh, one extra, some have a little bit less than one extra. So what it does is it washes out the, uh, the perfect um, uh, uh, 
excitation into the excited state when you're one cycle off. So what that means is that the center thing has this big peak, and then, then so, so this is microwave frequency this way, number of atoms in the excited state this way. The center peak is big, and then the next peak is small, and the next peak is smaller still. So the Ramsey spectrum looks like a big peak in the, in the center, and then smaller peaks on the outside. If the velocity is, is mono velocity, if it's a mono energetic beam, then what happens is that there's no fall. It just looks like sine wave. Now, that may sound great, but where's the center? <laughs> so actually having the velocity distribution is kind of a nice thing because it shows you exactly where the, the center of the resonance is. Now, with later plots, with cold atoms, then it turns out that these things make many, many oscillations before you can even see that there's an envelope to the thing. But fortunately, it doesn't matter because it's easy to tell where the resonance is within Hertz. Because even a rotten uh, oscillator that you buy uh, that's controlled by a crystal will be better than a part of 10 to 10. So it's easy to tell whether you're on resonance or not. When the separation between these things is a Hertz, which is what you get when you uh, do this with, with cold atoms. So it turns out it's still okay. But that's the effect of having a broad velocity distribution is that it washes out the subsequent peaks. Okay, now there's another question. Hey, Jack, you showed too, like uh, it works uh, for radio tuning. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you're looking at the flow, like itself, self focusing happens at fluid tuning. Yeah. Can that also be explained by similar model? Or? Yeah. So I have to think about that for a moment. Um, so, so, the, so, so what's uh, uh, what's being described here is that if you send a laser beam through a nonlinear medium, that is a medium where the index refraction depends upon the intensity of the light, then you can get a kind of a phenomenon known as self-focusing, where the laser beam will, will focus, it'll become tighter uh, because of its propagation through this medium. And the reason, one way of thinking about it is that you've got a high intensity in the center, and that changes the index more in the center than it does toward the outside, and it's like going through what's called a gradient index lens. Maybe the experimentalists probably know what that is, but you can buy a material where it's flat, but it acts like a lens because the index is higher uh, in the middle, which is just like having more stuff in the middle, which is what a lens, uh, at least a positive lens, does. And then the question is, can we think about this in a, uh, in a similar way? And I think the answer is yes, but you have to add another piece to this that I didn't tell you about, or at least I didn't tell you about enough. Remember at the beginning I said that the stimulated force from the bottom as being uh, absorption followed by stimulated emission so that you redistributed photons between two fields. In that picture, the force comes from the fact that you have to conserve momentum. And so if I move a photon from one momentum to another momentum, the atom has to recoil from that, uh, uh, with that same momentum. Well, if I've got uh, a gradient in, in, a, uh, in a system and I'm uh, having the, the atoms respond uh, by, for all the reasons that we've just shown, whatever picture you want, well, the light has to do the same thing in reverse. And that's the self focus Now, of course, when you put it into a medium uh, like that and you get that self-focusing, you aren't necessarily going to see the response of the medium, but in fact, there is one. But if the medium is really just you know, a heavy, massive thing, then you're not going to see the, uh, and if it's stiff, you're not going to see the, the momentum. But there will be a response to the medium. In fact, that very fact, the fact that the medium will respond, is used all the time to do something called optical tweezers. You have something like a little bead, or it could be a transparent cell, or a living cell, and you shine a laser beam on it. The laser beam is focused by the, the bead, just like the bead being a lens. And that changes the momentum of the light. That has to also change the momentum of the bead. And if it's a really small bead, you can move the bead around by virtue of the fact that the, uh, the light momentum has been changed. So as far as the details of the self-focusing and whether it's above or below resonance, it depends upon whether you're in a region of normal or anomalous dispersion, uh, which usually you're in normal dispersion with most media. Uh, that is, you're below the resonance 
because typically if you've got a transparent medium, that means that the resonances are at higher frequencies. But you can have situations where that's not the case, and then you have little change the sign of, uh, of uh, uh, the way in which the focus the self focusing work. So, other questions? Okay, you'll have more chances. It, um, also, any questions about the lies I told last night, for example? You know, I'd, I'd be happy to answer questions about that now that I've told you a little bit more of the truth. But of course, you know, you never get the complete truth. You understand that, right? There's a, there's, um, a, uh, uh, a, a conjugate relationship between truth and brevity. So if you want the whole truth, it's going to take forever. Okay, uh, let's go, uh, let's, let's, no, let's go back to where we were. Okay, so that was the pause for questions. Okay, so now let's get into the velocity dependence, the scattering force, because that's what, uh, what leads to laser pool. So, let's now think about what happens when we have two uh, uh, counterpropagating laser beams. I'm not sure why. I thought I had a slide in here someplace where I uh, had the um, I should have had a slide that had the dependence of the uh, of the scattering force on velocity, but I guess I don't have that. Uh, so let's think for just a moment about the force on this atom due to this laser beam. Just forget about this laser beam for a moment. So this is a force that is in the positive direction because it's going in the positive uh, positive direction. So this is the force that I call F plus here. So it's plus h bar k, the momentum of the photon, times gamma over 2, the maximum rate at which you can scatter photons, times this Lorentzian term. Now, this Lorentzian is the same thing that we had before, except that I changed delta uh, by a Doppler shift. The Doppler shift is k, 2 pi over lambda, times the velocity. Okay? This is the same thing as, um, as v over c times the, uh, times the frequency. Uh, uh, it's more convenient to write it this way. Now, for the positive force, that is for the force due to the laser beam going in this direction, to the right, the positive direction, the Doppler shift is minus k dot v. Why is that? If the v was in the positive direction, not the way I've shown it here, but if the v were in that direction, then that means that the atom would be going away from the laser beam. And obviously, if you're going away from the laser beam, the Doppler shift is negative. It makes it look like the frequency is lower than what it would be at rest. So that's why we have a negative sign here. And in the same way, if I take the F minus, the force that's going in the, uh, from the laser beam going in the negative direction, then that's the negative sign here, same thing as before. But it gets a positive sign of the Doppler shift because if the velocity is in the positive direction, the one that's shown here, it makes this laser beam appear to be higher in frequency. Now, the whole idea behind laser cooling is that if you tune the frequency of the laser delta so that it's below resonance, then when this atom is moving toward that, in other words, it has a negative velocity, then that negative velocity, along with this minus sign, is going to produce a positive uh, shift in the frequency. That positive shift in the frequency can compensate for the negative shift in the frequency that you put in when you chose the frequency to be below resonance. So this atom sees this laser beam as being closer to resonance. As does this atom, moving that way, sees this laser beam closer to resonance. So that means that the atom selectively sees the laser beam that opposes its motion as being the one that is closer to resonance and therefore favors uh, absorption from the laser beam that is closer to, uh, that, that is uh, opposing its motion. And that's why there's a damping force uh, due to this arrangement of, uh, of laser beams. Now, one of the things that I um, uh, want to point out here is that uh, I've written this in a form that is really an approximation. This approximation uh, shows up right here. The fact that I put in the power blocking term a, uh, an I prime, which is not necessarily I. In fact, it's generally not I. And the reason is that the atom is power broadened by both laser beams. And 
Uh, at very low intensity, I can just ignore this, and this will be an exact expression. At higher intensities, I can make this an exact expression if I make, if I make this 2 times i. If instead of having the two laser beams on simultaneously, I have the same average intensity, if I had this one on at twice the intensity for half the time, and this one on at twice the intensity for half the time, and just alternate between them. And if I do that alternation, not too fast and not too slow, it would be exactly the same as if I had the two laser beams on simultaneously, but there was no interference between the laser beams. But of course, both since both laser beams interact with the atoms, uh, uh, if I have them on both at the same time, then I'm going to have some other funny effects. And I've basically ignored all those funny effects in writing this expression. So here is the expression due to the positive uh, going force as a function of the velocity. Now you see, uh, it's when the velocity is negative that I get the maximum force. And that's because of the fact that it's tuned below resonance, and the, the Doppler shift will put you closer to resonance when velocity is negative. So that's what the force looks like from the laser beam coming from this direction. And that's what the force looks like. It's a negative force now for the laser beam coming from the other direction. And its uh, maximum is centered at a positive velocity. And now if I sum these two together, that's the, the total force, I get something that looks like this. It's zero when the velocity is zero because you've, uh, you've got no uh, uh, no preference for one laser or the other. They both have the same frequency, the same intensity, so the force is zero, the average force is zero, and the force will grow, and it's always in a direction that opposes the velocity. So this is always going to be a damping force. And over some reasonable region of velocity space, the force is a linear function of the velocity, so we could write the force is equal to minus alpha times v, where alpha is sometimes called the uh, friction coefficient. This is just like what happens with fluid viscosity at low velocities, that you have a force uh, that is uh, proportional to the velocity, uh, and in the opposite direction of the velocity. And it's this viscosity that gives this uh, uh, configuration the name of optical molasses, the fact that it looks like uh, viscosity. Uh, okay, so here it is again, uh, which you already saw. Uh, uh, so I won't do this, this is uh, just expanding it. Um, and uh, what you end up with then is the calculation that tells you what alpha is. So this whole expression here is alpha. You already had this from him, so I'm not going to go through it again. Uh, but you can maximize this, uh, this expression by choosing the intensity and the detuning in such a way as to maximize the, uh, the force and it maximizes uh, at an alpha that's equal to a quarter times h bar k squared. Okay? Now, if you plug that number into the parameters for sodium atoms, and sodium was the first thing we were doing these experiments with back in the, uh, the late 1970s, early 1980s, then you find that the damping force is such that the uh, fractional rate of change of the velocity, that is v dot divided by v, in other words, I have some constant velocity that's in this linear range, and I want to know how fast that velocity damp, it damps with an exponential time of 13 microseconds. So that's pretty fast. Uh, that means that, that would be the characteristic time for reducing the velocity to zero because of this, uh, uh, of this force. And, and the energy, which is proportional to v squared, will be damped twice as fast as that, something like six microseconds. So this is, tells you that laser cooling is, is working pretty fast. This is a good thing. OK, so, so we've talked so far about uh, the average force. What we've ignored is the fluctuations in that average force. Why are there fluctuations? Well, for one thing, there are spontaneous emissions. Those spontaneous emissions go off in random directions. and. Uh, so that creates a fluctuation of force. The average contribution of the spontaneous emissions is zero, but the mean square contribution of those things is not zero. So uh, how many people are familiar with the, uh, the, the idea of the random walk? It should be everybody, but it doesn't seem to be quite everybody. So let me just review that very, very quickly. 
the mathematical idea of a random walk is this. Uh, you have a drunk who uh, is uh, uh, so drunk that he doesn't know which way he's going. And therefore, when he, uh, but this drunk lives in a one-dimensional world. And so he's staggering, but each time he staggers, he staggers in a random direction. So sometimes he goes this way, and sometimes he goes this way, and each time it's completely random which way he's going to go. So his trajectory might look something like this. Okay, he's drunk, right? It's sometimes called the drunkard's wall, that's why. Uh, the solution to this problem, what's, what's, the, what's the question? How far away is the drunk from where he started after a certain number of steps n if each, n has the, if each step has the same size? And the answer is that uh, you take the number of steps, you take the square root of the number of steps, and the, the RMS distance that the drunk has moved will be the square root of the number of steps times the step size. Okay? So the square of the distance the root mean, the, 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 the mean square distance that the drunk has moved is going to be equal to the number of steps times the, uh, uh, times the step size. The mean distance that he's moved is zero. But the mean square distance that he's moved is equal to the number of steps times the step size. Well, if I'm an atom and I'm in momentum space now, okay, so this is momentum space, every time I do a spontaneous emission, if I'm in a one-dimensional world, then the spontaneous emission could go that way, which in case I take a step in momentum space that way. The next time I get a spontaneous emission, it might go that way, which in case I take a momentum step that way. And it's the same problem. It's the random walk uh, in momentum space. Now, uh, the square of the distance that I've moved in momentum space is proportional to the number of steps, right? According to the random walk. The square in momentum space is the energy. It's p squared over 2 and it's the energy. So that means the energy grows linearly with the number of steps, which means with time. I'm scattering photons at a certain rate. So there's a contribution due to the heating, for the heating of the atom due to the, uh, uh, the randomness of spontaneous emission. But that's not all. And this is one of the things that, uh, that people were confused about in the early days of laser pool. There's another term. And that other term is due to the randomness in the absorption process. Now, why is there randomness in the absorption process? Well, let's say that I've got two laser beams. I could absorb from that one or from that one. It's, you know, they're both close to my resonant frequency. So it's random. Uh, if I'm near zero velocity, it's random whether I'm going to absorb from that one or from that one. And so that means there's also a random walk in momentum space in this direction due to the absorption. Now, if the velocity is not near zero, then there's going to be a preference for absorbing from the laser beam uh, that opposes my motion. And that's the damping part. But the heating part near zero velocity is essentially independent of the, of the velocity because the total number of photons scattered is essentially uh, a constant as a function of velocity. As, I, as the velocity changes, I have a few more here and a few less here so, so that I have um, uh, the same number of total photons absorbed. Now, in the early days of laser cooling, some people thought we could avoid this problem by only having one of the laser beams on at a time. So just have that laser beam on, the, the, the model that I was telling you, where we just have one on at a time, and this means that I only can absorb from that. Another reason why people thought this was a good idea was that another way of thinking about the laser cooling process is by having by thinking about the dipole force of the atom moving in a standing wave. Remember when I have two laser beams, I create a standing wave. That means I've got a gradient of intensity that has a period of half the wavelength. That produces a dipole force. That dipole force has fluctuations. We're going to talk about them a little bit later. But you calculate the fluctuation of the dipole force, and that's the same term as this fluctuation in the absorption. So people thought, well, if we don't have any dipole force, get rid of the, uh, the interference between the two laser beams, that term will go away. Not true. The reason is that there's still a fluctuation in the force due to the, uh, the absorption because the number of photons absorbed during any given period of time is a random variable. So there's a certain average number of photons that you absorb, and at least in, some, in most reasonable limits, it's going to be a Poisson distribution around that average number. 
It's not always Poissonian. Just be warned that there are cases where it will be sub-Poissonian or super-Poissonian, but typically it's approximate Poissonian. So that means there's going to be a variation in the number of photons absorbed during any given time. That means there's a fluctuation in the force. And it's the same fluctuation. You can't get rid of it. And so uh, some people thought you could get to a lower temperature by removing some of the fluctuations. You can't. Um, so I think that what I'm going to do is to not go through this whole calculation of the cooling limit, because Han did this for you already, right? And uh, so just to remind you of what is done, the way in which you're going to calculate the, um, the cooling limit is to say there's a certain rate at which I lose energy when I've got a certain velocity. There's a certain rate at which I lose energy uh, that's been given by this, uh, this damping coefficient, right? So I've got forces equal to minus alpha times V. Uh, I, uh, uh, the, uh, the force times the velocity is the power, right? So minus alpha times V squared is the rate at which energy is being removed by the pulling force. The rate at which energy is being put in by the randomness of spontaneous emission and the randomness of absorption is twice times the rate of scattering photons once for absorption, once for emission. So twice the rate of scattering photons times the, uh, the energy that corresponds to a, uh, uh, a single photon, what we call the recoil energy. Okay? So you equate those two things. One of them has the velocity in it, because it's minus alpha times v squared, and the other doesn't have the velocity in it. So when you equate them, you get an expression for the velocity squared, and that velocity squared tells you what the energy is, and that's the cooling limit. And so you just do that, and, uh, and you, get the, uh, you get the cooling limit, which depends upon, so here's what, what the cooling limit is, which is to say what the equilibrium temperature is. And it's this expression that depends on what the detuning is. Uh, and this is in the, uh, the low intensity limit where I could remove the power broadening from the denominator. It's independent of the intensity. Okay, we assumed that the intensity was very much less than 1. We also assumed that the velocity was small enough that the Doppler shift is smaller than the, uh, than the line width and the, and the detuning. And then this is the answer you get. Now, then you can minimize this by uh, finding what, what the minimum value of delta is that minimizes this number. And you find that it uh, minimizes when uh, delta uh, is a half gamma. Okay? And that minimum value is that Kt is h bar gamma over 2. And for sodium, that's 240 microkelvin. For cesium, it's about 140 microkelvin. And uh, uh, this was a 1D, a 1D calculation, but it turns out it's valid in 3D as well. And the reason is that um, in, when you do the 1D calculation, you assume that the photons are all radiated along one dimension. But in fact, they're not. 